It is truly an honor and a pleasure to introduce to you for this Axenfeld lecture, lecture Professor Fotis Topuzis. He had a, a medical degree from his university in Thessaloniki in Greece and was trained in ophthalmology in Paris at the Saint Antoine and had a PhD in psychophysics at uh, the University of Tras in Greece. Following that, he had a fellowship in comprehensive ophthalmology and cornea at the uh, National Center of Ophthalmology, the Cannes Vent Hospital in Paris. And after that, a glaucoma fellowship at the Jules Stein Eye Institute in Los Angeles. In 2001, he became lecturer in ophthalmology, initiating officially his uh, brilliant academic career uh, in Thessaloniki. And, uh, became the head and founder of the Laboratory of Research and Clinical Applications in Ophthalmology. So he had already the wisdom and uh, the vision. He's currently chair of the first department of ophthalmology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and is visiting professor at the Jules Stein Eye Institute. Uh, was awarded the Distinguished Foreign Resident Award from the College of Medicine of the hospitals in Paris and had a doctoral award from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. He was also awarded the Schaeffer International Fellowship and by the Glaucoma Research Foundation in uh, San Francisco. He belongs to uh, several editorial boards and is a regular reviewer for many ophthalmology journals. For the European Glaucoma Society, he was the past chair of the program planning committee, new vice president of EGS and vice chair of the EGS Foundation, co-chair in the program committee of the Glaucoma Research Society and member of the board of governors of the World Glaucoma Association. His present main interests are epidemiology and clinical and genetic research. We focus in glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. He is the principal investigator of two large population-based studies, the Thessaloniki eye study and the URI study. Above everything, this is not science-based, this is uh, personal observation. He is a wonderful man, wonderful physician, gifted with a great family with two children. And uh, I really had uh, the privilege of, uh, if I may say so, become also a good friend. Please, Fotis. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo, for the very nice introduction. And before, and thank you for the friendship also. Before starting the presentation, I would like to say thank you to the board of the European Society of Ophthalmology for the great privilege and the great honor to invite me for the Theodore Axenfeld Lecture. I'm very grateful for this invitation. I propose the title of a 20-year journey towards gaining insight into glaucoma, the Thessaloniki eye study. Here is the financial disclosure. Let's start with some beautiful images. Where these images come from? I will be helpful for you. These images come from a place which is well known to all of us from the Greek mythology. It is the destination that had the Odysseus from the Greek mythology. It is the island of Ithaca in Greece. And the poet tells us, as you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. My journey was long enough and was full of adventure and full of discovery, as it is highlighted here by the several publications that came out of it. The destination was glaucoma. 
And the story started back in 1997, 1998, while I was doing my glaucoma fellowship at Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. At this same, at that year, at this same year, the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting was held in San Francisco. And I attended the Glaucoma Subspecialty Day, where it all started because of that day, attending the agenda on glaucoma of that Glaucoma Subspecialty Day, at the end of the day, I conceived the idea of conducting a population-based study in Thessaloniki. And that same day, I was invited to dinner by Dr. Roy Wilson, who was one of my supervisors during the fellowship. And during the dinner, I expressed to him from, for the first time my just conceived idea of conducting a population-based study in Thessaloniki. After several months and during my fellowship, both my supervisors, doctors Roy Wilson and Arne Coleman, came back to me and they let me know that they were prepared to support this project. And they were prepared to support with a common research focus in epidemiology, providing with their expertise and with startup funding from their institutions. Later on, Alan Harris joined the group to extend the expertise in vascular disease analysis as related to glaucoma and blood flow. Before going over the study, let's go over the fundamentals. There are three major scientific areas contributing to the investigation determinants of human health and disease. Basic biomedical science, clinical science and public health science with epidemiology as their core. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of disease frequency in man. And frequency relates to the quantification of disease occurrence in human populations. Such data are needed for further investigation of patterns of disease in subgroups of the population. This involves describing the distribution of health status in terms of age, sex, race, geography, etc. Prevalence is a key term in epidemiology and is defined as the proportion of a population that has a disease at a specific point in time. It's very important in order to evaluate disease burden, public health issues and services, and to take prevalence into account while evaluating and designing preventive measures and screening programs. Incidence is another key term in epidemiology and is defined as the proportion of people who develop new disease during a specified period of time. It's very important incidence to evaluate risk and the probability of developing a disease during a specified period and facilitates clinical and public health interventions. The methods used to describe the distribution of diseases may be considered as a prerequisite to identify the determinants of human health and disease. Epidemiology provides data regarding the why and how of disease occurrence, assessment of demographic characteristics, including genetic or immunologic makeup, behaviors, environmental exposures, or other so-called potential risk factors is an important part in epidemiology. Ideally, the findings provide sufficient evidence to direct prompt and effective public health control and prevention measures. Why is it important to identify risk factors? First, in order to identify high-risk individuals. We all know this history of Angelina Jolie, the knowledge of her lifetime risk for breast cancer uh, guided her to major decisions. Another reason why it's important to identify these factors is in order to develop prediction models. And cardiologists, our colleagues, were pioneering in that respect. We have in our hands in glaucoma the prediction model for ocular hypertension conversion to glaucoma. And another reason why it's important to identify these factors is to explore pathophysiology. Indeed, the disease itself, cigarette smoking and lung cancer association led us to chemical mechanisms and approaches to prevention. But how do we identify these factors? 
population-based studies is uh, the ideal setup since they provide with low risk of bias in selecting participants, which are randomly selected from the general population. And there are cross-sectional studies providing prevalence estimates and longitudinal study provides incidence estimates. Even the cross-sectional studies are very difficult to conduct, not only for the organization per, uh, reasons, but also, most importantly, in order to recruit the patients. We need to have randomly selected from the population is, is not the patients that are coming by themselves in the hospital and to invite them to participate in a project. This is very difficult to recruit and especially you need to have at least 70% of participation rates in order for your study to be representative of the population. And for the longitudinal studies, it's even more difficult because you need to go back to the baseline group and uh, ask them again to come back and they became older and it's for, more difficult for them to participate. Many of the advances in ocular diseases, including glaucoma, have been derived from population-based studies and in many respects, they are the most valid and often the only a way to determine the prevalence and incidence of a disease, risk factors for complex multifactorial diseases like glaucoma, interaction of genetic markers with systemic and environmental factors, and the effectiveness of screening strategies. There are a few population-based studies on glaucoma that have been conducted in European populations. Among them is the Thessaloniki eye study. Let's now go over the study. Our study was conducted in Thessaloniki at Aristotle University with a collaboration of three U.S. universities providing with scientific expertise and uh, startup funding, and I'm very grateful for their decision to support the study. Uh, by the time Dr. Roy Wilson had moved to Texas Tech University. The prevalence study had a population aged 60 years and over with a participation rate of 71% and with over 2,500 participants. The Incident study, 12 years later at mean, had a participation rate of 74%. There were almost 1,500 uh, the survivors inv invited, and among them, 1100, almost 1,100 participated. The Saloniki study provided data on open angle coma prevalence and risk factors. The prevalence of the study was 5.5%. And this is divided to 3.8% for operant glaucoma and 1.7% for exfoliation glaucoma. Please keep the, in mind that this is a population with high prevalence of exfoliation glaucoma, and this gave us the opportunity to explore exfoliation at a certain extent. This is the multivariate analysis of risk factors for open and glaucoma, and what was confirmed here is IOP, 21% increased risk per millimeter of mercury, coronary artery bypass or vascular surgery, almost two times increased risk, moderate and uh, higher to moderate myopia, and of course, exfoliation, three times increased risk, almost three times increased risk for those with exfoliation. Because, as I said, we had high prevalence of exfoliation, we had several papers coming out for, for exfoliation, and we are going to discuss them. The prevalence of exfoliation syndrome in the, uh, in, in the population was almost 12%. And among them, 15.2% presented with glaucoma. So although there is a strong link well known between exfoliation and glaucoma, the majority didn't, of those with exfoliation didn't have glaucoma. But a large proportion, 15%, presented with glaucoma. And to appreciate that, the presence of glaucoma among those with, without exfoliation was 4.7%, while the presence of glaucoma among those with exfoliation was 15%, showing the uh, important role of exfoliation in glaucoma development. How our results compare with the Blue Mountains size study, and I'm focusing on comparison with the Blue Mountains because it's one of the few population-based studies of Caucasians to assess exfoliation and exfoliation glaucoma, and both studies share the same methodology. Now, here are the prevalence estimates. As you can see, one at the first glance could say that the overall prevalence open, for open angle glaucoma, the prevalence of, for primary open angle glaucoma, and the prevalence for exfoliation glaucoma was higher in our population compared to uh, 
the Blue Mountains population. But as you can see up there, the Blue Mountains population was much younger. Therefore, if we adjust for age, what we see is that primary open glaucoma prevalence was quite similar between the two studies. And the higher prevalence of exfoliation glaucoma in our population was as an add-on to this, resulting to higher overall prevalence for open glaucoma in our study. The higher prevalence of exfoliation glaucoma in our study was related to the higher prevalence of exfoliation syndrome in our study, 12% as compared to 2.3% to, to in the Blue Mountain study. This showing that there may be uh, different in uh, factors contributing to uh, development of exfoliation syndrome between the two populations, uh, especially regarding eventually the genetic background or other environmental factors. On the other hand, interestingly, though the rates of glaucoma among those with exfoliation was quite similar between the two studies. And these having similar uh, rates of glaucoma among those with exfoliation between the two studies, one being high prevalent for exfoliation syndrome and the other low prevalent, indicate that there may be different factors contributing to the glaucoma uh, among those with exfoliation compared to the factors contributing to development of exfoliation syndrome. Now, we looked also on association of exfoliation syndrome with history of systemic diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases, because it has been reported by previous studies a potential association with, of exfoliation with cardiovascular disease. And we found no association in our study. However, we found an association with hist of exfoliation with history of cataract surgery that has been confirmed also in other studies. In contrast to our findings in the Blue Mountain study, it was reported that exfoliation was associated with cardiovascular diseases, as you can see here. The discrepancy in the findings with regards to association of exfoliation with cardiovascular disease between our study and the Blue Mountain study may be due to the fact that the Blue Mountain study is of younger age, and in our study there may be a selective death in people with vascular factors and angina, so we don't have them in the population of that age we examine. On the other hand, the Saloniki study has not found the association despite more statistical power because it had more exfoliative cases in the population. And here, very important, our study was the first population-based study assessing potential risk factors for primary open glaucoma and exfoliation glaucoma independently. What does it mean? We looked on models looking on factors risk factors for primary open glaucoma among those without exfoliation, and separately in risk factors for exfoliative glaucoma among those with exfoliation. And why this is important, we can see next. Here is again the model we just saw for the overall open glaucoma, where exfoliation is a covariate in the model. Of course, it became evident that is uh, related with increased risk for primary, for, um, open and glaucoma. This has been done, the analysis also in other studies has been confirmed the role of exfoliation. But now looking on separate models, what we saw is that age and uh, high uh, IOP, 90% increased risk for uh, per millimeter of mercury were confirmed for primary open and glaucoma as well as uh, cardiovascular risk factors for primary open and glaucoma. On the other hand, in uh, analysis separate for exfoliation glaucoma, only IOP was confirmed, and in this time, 25% increased risk per millimeter of mercury as compared to the 19% the, uh, of increased risk for prime, per millimeter of mercury for primary open and glaucoma. One would say here, so for exfoliation glaucoma is only the IOP that is a risk factor for for development among those with exfoliation. In order to explore further this, we did an analysis on the likelihood of having glaucoma among those with exfoliation and without exfoliation by screening IOP. And what we found is that for the same screening IOP, there was three times increased likelihood to have glaucoma among those with exfoliation as compared to those without exfoliation. 
So there may be additional factors to IOP that contributed to exfoliative glaucoma. One would say uh, that we may miss the point here that exfoliation presents with high vari variation in the IOP, and then thus it is true at an ex in an extent. However, when you have big numbers to analyze, big uh, numbers in participants, then there is a regression to the mean of the values. And it remains unclear whether there is greater vulnerability of the optic nerve in patients with exfoliation syndrome for the same IOP. In order to explore further this, we did a recent analysis comparing the structure of the optic disc among those with exfoliation compared to those without exfoliation in non-glaucoma participants of the study. And we saw no difference with regards to optic disc structure as measured with HRT. So optic disc structure does not differ between exfoliative and non-exfoliative subjects without glaucoma in our population. And therefore, there is no structural predisposition to glaucoma development in exfoliative subjects. However, predisposition to glaucoma development due to biochemical or neurotrophic differences of the optic nerve among those with and without exfoliation cannot be excluded based on our data. We also know that there is a specific geographical distribution in exfoliation. And by that, there, uh, it is uh, suggestive that there may be a genetic background specific to the populations. Indeed, we know the, uh, very, the great study conducted in Scandinavia where the, it was found a strong association of exfoliation syndrome and exfoliation glaucoma conferred by three SMPs in the LOXL1 gene. The, Two SMPs here were confirmed. The third lost statistical significance after adjusting for the results of the other two. We wanted to confirm these findings in our study, and we conducted genetic analysis. And uh, what we found is that uh, we confirmed the role of SMP in coding exon G153D that was significantly associated with both, both exfoliation syndrome and exfoliation glaucoma in our study. Do those results support the clinical use of a genetic test? Let's see if this would mean anything. Unfortunately, the SMP difference here, the SMP frequency is high not only in cases, but also in controls, which would mean that a genetic test would have a high sensitivity, but very low specificity for exfoliation syndrome resulting in false positive. One would say, it would be much more clinically relevant to see whether a genetic test would help to predict not only who will develop exfoliation syndrome, but specifically who among those with exfoliation will develop glaucoma, exfoliative glaucoma. And this is important as we know, uh, we know that in our population, 15% among those exfoliation presented with exfoliative glaucoma, it would be very clinically relevant to have a prediction for them. Unfortunately, the SMP frequency was very similar among those with exfoliation syndrome and exfoliative glaucoma. This means that the genetic test would be ineffective in identifying those with exfoliation who will develop glaucoma. And this is consistent with the discussion we had while comparing with the Blue Mountain Science study that the factors in this case, maybe gen genetics, are different uh, with regards to exfoliation syndrome development as compared to glau glaucoma, uh, exfoliative glaucoma development. Now, let's go to see our incident data and go over the 12-year incidence and baseline risk factors for exfoliation, which is very recently published last month in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. This is an American Ophthalmological Society thesis for me. And we found that the 12-year incidence of exfoliation syndrome was 19.6%, very high rates. How this compares with other populations, there are few studies looking on incidence of exfoliation around the world. And at the first glance, this, uh, our finding here, the overall incidence seems higher compared to other studies. However, because of difference in the length of the follow-up, we need to uh, focus on the annual incidence of exfoliation. And in this case, our annual incidence is very comparable to those in, the, in Sweden. 
somehow higher compared to those in Iceland and much higher compared to those in India where the population seems to be low prevalent, low incident on exfoliation. Let's look now on risk factors analysis we conducted for incident exfoliation and for incident glaucoma in those with exfoliation. We, in risk factors analysis for incident exfoliation syndrome, we found that age was associated as well as, and that is relatively new finding, the shorter axial length. The shorter axial length, the higher the likelihood for incident exfoliation syndrome. Previously, the Begina study has reported, this was a cross-sectional study, has reported a shorter axial length being associated with presence of exfoliation. And also the shorter axial anterior chamber depth being associated with exfoliation. And the investigators in the Beijing study suggested that the shorter anterior chamber depth may be related with zonular laxity in those with exfoliation, forward movement of the lens, resulting in shorter anterior chamber depth. However, the shorter axial length by itself could be a contributor to shorter anterior chamber depth. In our study, which is a longitudinal study, a much uh, more robust in identifying risk factors confirmed the shorter axial length uh, being uh, associated, uh, being a risk factor for development of f exfoliation syndrome. How our data compare with other studies? The five-year data of Ray Kievic study uh, found the older age being associated with incident uh, exfoli exfoliation syndrome. Consumption of fru fruit was protective. In the 12-year data, no associations were found. However, this study was small in size, only 900 participants at baseline. Now, 12 years, they have uh, very few left in, in the study. In the Chennai Eye study, uh, they reported at six years data, older age to be a risk factor for incident exfoliation syndrome, rural incidents, which may be related to environmental factors like solar radiation, illiteracy, and cephalophagia and nuclear cataract, although these two last factors are not, may not be considered as uh, risk factors for incident exfoliation, but uh, as potential associations with exfoliation. We wanted also to evaluate the role of exfoliation uh, at baseline as predictive for uh, vascular disease development. And we, we ran this regression model and we found no association of exfoliation at baseline with vascular uh, disease development at 12 years. So this is consistent with our findings at baseline where we reported no association of exfoliation syndrome with vascular factors. Then another interesting aspect is the incidence of exfoliation glaucoma among those with exfoliation syndrome. We, have as, we had as many as 241 study participants that fulfilled all of the following, participated in clinic examination in both baseline and incident studies, had exfoliation at baseline or at incidence, and had no glaucoma at baseline. Out of, uh, this is the uh, population at risk for glaucoma development among those with exfoliation. And among those, 9.1% were diagnosed with exfoliation glaucoma during the 12 years follow-up examination in the Thessaloniki study, which compares with a 15% probability of glaucoma among those with exfoliation after 10 years of follow-up in the Olm Olmsted County at Minnesota. And the risk factors for incident exfoliation glaucoma among those with exfoliation, we found the higher RP between uh, the two eyes, the 26% increased risk per millimeter of, of mercury, which is in line with the 25% per millimeter of mercury found in our prevalence study. And a new finding is the heart attack. Heart attack at, uh, at baseline increased the risk by 13 times for uh, exfoliation glaucoma development. And this is quite important, but we need to sum up and to clarify. We said no association of exfoliation syndrome with vascular diseases, and, but heart attack is a risk factor for glaucoma development among those with exfoliation. The consumption of, of alcohol had a protective effect for glaucoma de develop, development among those with exfoliation, regardless of the amount of consumption. And uh, if we want to summarize, the role of IOP was confirmed, new findings, the history of heart attack, 
A hypothesis could be that possibly through reperfusion injury, this needs to be uh, confirmed by other studies. And the alcohol consumption having a protective role, we know from the literature that moderate alcohol consumption has been reported to be protective for other neurodegenerative diseases. Now, we looked also on the problem of undiagnosed glaucoma and overdiagnosis. These are the two uh, sides of the same problem, which is our accuracy in diagnosing glaucoma. And we found 50% of undiagnosed glaucoma in our population, which is e exactly in line with what was presented in Blue Mountains, in the uh, Rotterdam study, and in the Baltimore Eye Survey in the US. And among them, primary open eye glaucoma was significantly more undiagnosed compared to exfoliation glaucoma. When we first saw this result, we thought that this may be because exfoliation glaucoma presents with higher IOP, therefore it's less likely to be missed, the diagnosis for exfoliative glaucoma. And we wanted to explore further that. We looked on regression models uh, uh, adjusting for different factors to explore factors associated with undiagnosed glaucoma. And after adjusting for many factors, including age, family history for glaucoma, history of cataract surgery, visual field status, uh, visual acuity, IOP, and CD ratio, after adjusting for all factors describing the disease, then uh, primary open glaucoma was almost three times more likely to be undiagnosed compared to exfoliative glaucoma. But after adjusting for all these factors, and make uh, for describing the profile of the disease, what is, remains to be different is the presence of exfoliative material. And when we ophthalmologists see the exfoliative material of the slit lamp, and because we are alert, this is a strong risk factor for glaucoma, we change our attitude, the way we approach the patient, and we uh, miss less times the diagnosis. And in this model, we added, we added another factor, the last time that they have seen an eye doctor, and this is important, those that haven't seen an eye doctor for the last 12 months had six times increased risk to be undiagnosed compared to those that have seen an eye doctor during the last 12 months. This is a positive contribution of us, ophthalmologists. On the other hand, among those that remain to be undiagnosed, one out of three had actually visited an eye doctor during the last 12 months and the diagnosis was missed. And why is that? It's because of the CD ratio. The smaller the CD ratio, the higher the likelihood for a patient of, with primary open angle coma to be undiagnosed. And uh, we need to think about that because we have all been uh, uh, educated to look on the CD ratio while evaluating a patient for glaucoma. However, small discs with very small caps at baseline, let's say 0.1, they may get significant damage, they may go up to 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and we still consider them having small CD ratio, and we easily miss the diagnosis at, as it comes out from the data. In addition, the CD ratio is associated with the disc size, as it shows here, in normals, and it's the same thing for glaucoma patients. And we see how great overlap uh, is in there between glaucoma and controls with regards to CD ratio and for the same disc size. So cap to disc ratio is not an accurate tool to distinguish glaucoma from normals. And we need to draw our attention, instead of looking on the empty space, we need to draw our, our attention clinically on the rim, where is the tissue and the potential damage. We looked also on overdiagnosis, and we looked on the prevalence of overdiagnosis in our population. And for this purpose, at first, we used a conservative definition for self-reported glaucoma, not including history of IOP lowering treatment and history of high IOP. And in this case, the frequency of self-reported glaucoma in the population was 2.2%. 60% among them were overdiagnosed, resulting in 1.3% uh, prevalence of overdiagnosis in the population, representing the low prevalence estimates since it was relied in a conservative definition. If the definition was less conservative, then the prevalence of overdiagnosis would be 5.5%, representing the high prevalence estimate in the population, it being equal, exactly equal to the prevalence of open-angle glaucoma itself in the population for every uh, single 
case of glaucoma in the population, another case of, of overdiagnosed glaucoma. So the data on overdiagnosis are scarce in the literature. The few existing data from Gutenberg study and the visual impairment project are in line with our findings. And we wanted also to look on factors associated with overdiagnosis. And what we found is the following. Family history was associated with seven times increased risk for overdiagnosis. And history of cataract surgery was also associated with seven times increased risk for overdiagnosis. And when we added the last time they, they saw another factor in the model, the last time they saw an eye doctor, visual acuity equal or less than 2,200 2, became also uh, a risk factor for overdiagnosis. And family history and history of cataract surgery was reconfirmed with higher odds ratios. If we want to comment on this, the association with poor visual acuity, possibly there, there is an inability of eyes with poor vision to perform, to perform a visual field test, and this limits our ability to accurate diagnosis. The association with family history of glaucoma means that clinicians may be using risk factors as diagnostic criteria, or alternatively, and more likely, when they know they, there is a positive family history, they become bias and they assign more easily the diagnosis of glaucoma. One would say, if this was the case, why you, we did not find an association of elevated RP with uh, overdiagnosis? The explanation for this, this is uh, that in our population, almost 60% of overdiagnosed individuals were receiving medical treatment, so the actual IOP values that we measured were already lowered by the, receiving, uh, the treatment that they received. The association with cataract surgery is a possible surrogate for having visited an ophthalmologist. And we saw for the undiagnosed glaucoma, of ophthalmologist has had a key role in reducing the problem of undiagnosed glaucoma and regular visits to ophthalmologists. On the, other he on the other hand, it seems that ophthalmologists may produce also false positives. So we are not balancing our decisions with regards to glaucoma diagnosis, it seems. We are overweighted in both sides, and the resources we have in our hands, human resources and funding, are not properly used since we have half of glaucoma cases not being diagnosed and not receiving care, and many overdiagnosed patients in the population receiving care which is not needed. Last part of the presentation will focus on blood pressure, perfusion pressure status, and antihypertensive treatment as they relate to glaucoma. The blood pressure status was a concept in analysis of such data that was initiated uh, for the first time by our study. And the first report that opened the way to this direction is, is or in regression models with uh, diastolic perfusion pressure and diastolic blood pressure as continuous variables in non-glaucoma participants in our study. Both of them, as well as the use of antihypertensive treatment, treatment, all were significantly associated with optic disc structure, meaning increased capping and thinner rim area as measured with HRT. The conclusion by that would be that low diastolic blood pressure and antihypertensive treatment are independently associated with optic disc structure, which would be a misinterpretation of the data. Because in the stratified analysis we did, this association was confirmed only in the subgroup having diastolic blood pressure less than 90 and treated for systemic hypertension, but not in the other groups, including the one with similar diastolic blood pressure values, but untreated for systemic hypertension. This study in non-glaucoma participants helps in interpretation because the association found was not confounded by glaucoma status, which is a confounding factor in optic disc appearance, and not confounded by high IOP since the IOP was similar between the groups. Following this analysis, we looked on the association with optic disc structure in subjects with, system, with diastolic blood pressure of less than 90 for the different classes of medications. And uh, it was confirmed that this was the case for all classes of antihypertensive medications. Therefore, the associations found in our study are mediated through the lower blood pressure per se, per se and not the specific mechanism of action of the antihypertensive medications. 
The hypothesis around these findings are, uh, this is that diastolic blood pressure, low diastolic blood pressure due to antihypertensive treatment may be associated with optic nerve fiber loss and optic disc structure changes and excessive reduction in systemic blood pressure with the use of antihypertensive treatment could reduce optic nerve hair blood flow below a critical level in an already compromised microvascular bed with impaired autoregulation due to hypertension status and resulting in further ischemia. And this potentially is a predisposing to glaucoma development in the presence of other factors which may act independently or in synergy with diastolic blood pressure status. However, this is a hypothesis and needs to be confirmed uh, further before translating this to the clinical practice. We looked also in the ocular perfusion pressure and we know that there is a, a, a definition of ocular perfusion pressure that has limitations. This, this definition includes systemic blood pressure as a surrogate for ocular arterial pressure my, minus intraocular pressure, which conventionally equals to ocular venous pressure. Despite those limitations, the definition has been universally used in clinical and epidemiologic studies and with very relevant findings. In our study, we found that low diastolic perfusion pressure was associated with increased risk for primary open angle glaucoma only in those receiving antihypertensive treatment, which is consistent with our analysis in non glaucoma participants. However, recently it became evident that adjusting for IOP, as it was the case also in our study and in other studies, in a model containing ocular perfusion pressure will inevitably result in the situation that the coefficients for ocular perfusion pressure actually represent the effect of blood pressure. Therefore, our findings on diastolic perfusion pressure are relevant for diastolic blood pressure. And similar findings on diastolic perfusion pressure has been, have been reported in other studies, but these studies did not perform an analysis by blood pressure status or by perfusion pressure status, as I, we think is critical for this kind of analysis. Now, the main points that were touched by our study in contributing our study to the puzzle of glaucoma, to different pieces of information constituting the glaucoma puzzle are on risk factors for primary open angle glaucoma and exfoliation glaucoma, increased glaucoma risk for the same IOP in exfoliative subjects, rates of and risk factors for undiagnosed and overdiagnosed glaucoma, risk factors for incident exfoliation and conversion to exfoliation glaucoma, association of LOXL1 and exfoliation syndrome exfoliation glaucoma, open angle glaucoma, primary open angle glaucoma, exfoliation syndrome and exfoliation glaucoma prevalence, exfoliation syndrome incidence, and blood pressure status consent and the role of antihypertensive treatment. Now, to conclude, I must say that this was a long journey and I, again, I would like to be thankful, thankful to the co-investigators in order to, for this journey, to, for this study to become a reality, a laboratory had to be uh, founded and uh, created from scratch in our place. This is the Laboratory of Research and Clinical Applications in Ophthalmology, a laboratory dedicated to research and specifically to the Thessaloniki I study. And by coincidence, recently, I was back where it all started from because I was invited to the annual meeting of the American Glaucoma Society last March. To, that was held again in San Francisco to present data of the Thessaloniki study on overdiagnosis, on glaucoma overdiagnosis. And this is really a great coincidence because there the story started and that was a cycle that uh, went back to the same place. The Thessaloniki study is a gold mine of glaucoma knowledge and the data mi mining is still ongoing we have last month the first paper out from the incident study. We have much more to learn from the study. Here are the Thessaloniki study gold miners. As you can see here from this long list of collaborators, I was not alone in this journey. I was joined by many people who shared the journey 
who shared also the vision of the journey, who demonstrated abilities and dedication to reach the destination, it was really for all of us a very, uh, a very rewarding experience, a life experience, and I hope for all of us was rewarding. I would like to thank them all, each one of them, for their hard working. And for the end, this is my hidden treasure, my family. Uh, my wonderful wife, Kelly, who has been supportive through all these years. It, Kelly has been instrumental in being my source of energy and my source of endurance. Our children, Nikos and Lida, all three of them very supportive throughout these years and very tolerant because they tolerated the endless hours of absence to work. And going back to the poet, which tells us, keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this, uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, it really uh, showed what uh, epidemiology, uh, epidemiology uh, um, can do for us. And uh, speaking with the words of Homer, Andra moyena poluta hosma la pola plante eptai de trias, which actually means enjoy the journey and not the destination. Thank you very much for this. <laughs>